Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Father God, each and every moment we have with you is a blessing, something we can't ever take for granted because we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but we know who's in charge. And we know that we can trust you regardless of the circumstances. And when we follow you, you cause all things to work together for good. Not the way we always want them, but the way that things are best for your glory. We're going to see that tonight. And I pray, Father, you'll speak to our hearts and prepare us for what the future might bring so that we're walking with you and can trust you in all things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're not going to review tonight what we talked about last week, but we will, as we go through the rest of Daniel, so much of this is prophetic, and it blends together. So we will gradually bring this all together. If you're feeling a little confused, don't worry about it. You're in good company. <laughs> But we will explain it all as we go along. So with that said, we are going to open tonight in Daniel chapter 8 and read Daniel's second vision. Now you recall that the other prophetic chapter in chapter 2 was the king's dream and Daniel interpreted. This now is the second vision that Daniel had, the last one being chapter 7. And just, I guess, for a moment of review, what was the vision in chapter 7 about? Well, good, you got the idea. They're about animals. The lion, the bear, the leopard, and the DBT. Dreadful and terrifying beast. So that's what that was about. There was a little confusion as to what it might mean because the Bible doesn't tell us what it means. But I think you'll see some similarities as we continue in the book of Daniel to maybe help interpret chapter 7. Well, with that going on, let's move to Daniel chapter 8, 1 and 2. That reads, in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar the king. Who can tell me what year that was? Okay, 551 B.C. is when it was. It was two years after the vision he had in chapter 7. And that makes Daniel how old? 70. Okay, yeah, 69 or 70 years of age. Now, we can relate to that because a lot in this room are probably that age. Do you have visions from God? <laughs> do you hear from God like Daniel heard from God? Why do you think Daniel kept having visions or hearing from God at this stage in his life? Oh, God could trust him. And why could God trust him? Because he walked with God. That's the key. We have to realize, and Daniel's a great example to us, of walking with God all the time all the days of our lives. We met him when he was, give or take, 17 years old. And this man never faltered. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ezekiel, he's mentioned along with Noah and, I can't think of who the other one is, uh, who were, were righteous men because Daniel never faltered in his faith. And when we walk strongly in our faith like that, God can trust us and we can trust God. God will use us and continue to use us. If you think you're 65 years old, so you can therefore retire out of life, is that the case? No, no you may retire from your job, but Daniel's 69 or 70 years old, and he, has not, he not only hasn't retired from God's work, but he continues until his very last days. And that's how we should be. Always growing closer to God, always getting to know him more through his word, Always being obedient to what he shows us and tells us. Are you that way? Not, don't answer. <laughs> Me. <laughs> answer God. Now, if you're not, it's not too late. All you have to do is confess that you haven't been walking as strongly with God as he wants you to and let him do the rest. And he will because then you can be a person like Daniel. Daniel was a strong man in the Lord. All right, so we see it's the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king. And a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. 
And we know again that was two years before. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Yule Canal. Was Daniel actually at the canal? No, no. no he was in his vision. Now, this is a map of where the East Susa is. Susa would later become the capital of Persia. Uh, we know that in Esther. We also know that it was an active city during that time, but it, we know it was the capital at the time of Esther. So that's Elam, and you've got a little square up at the top to show you where the canal is, which is right beside Susa. And yet, Daniel's not there. That's where he is in his vision. Interesting that God would put him there, but that is because it pertains to the vision that he's going to have. So let's read what that vision is. It tells us in Daniel 8, 3 and 4. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming, coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power, but he did as he pleased and magnified himself. Now, what does that tell you about this ram? What do we know just from this? Not from later, but from this. Powerful. He is very powerful, and nobody, it says, can rescue um, he magnified himself that nobody can rescue from his power. That's probably why Daniel's standing at this canal is because that is going to have significance as to what this ram means and what happens when we see the goat in the next verse. All right, so this is a powerful ram, and it's basically, it says it's budding, so it's actively conquering north, south, and west. Not east, though. Interesting. We'll see that in a minute. We'll get a little bit more insight into that in a minute. Now we see in verses 5 and 6 that there's another animal. This time it's a ram. While I was observing, behold, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a goat. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. Huh? That's pretty hard to do. What does that signify? Power, speed, just shoom. You know, when you, they say you're fast as wind, well, wind doesn't touch the ground, it just moves. Mm -hmm. So it's very swift. And it says, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had had two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. Oh boy, here we have two animals again. This time they're fighting each other. Last time we didn't see that in chapter 7, but now these two animals are. It tells us in the next verse, I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him. He struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Interesting, because what do we say the ram had lots of? Power. power. <clears throat> but the ram does not have enough power to withstand the power of the goat. You can understand why Danny, Daniel was really confused when he had these visions. Because <laughs> who uh, would have any clue what any of this means if somebody didn't interpret it? In Daniel 8.8, 8, we're told, Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. So we go from one horn on the goat, that's cut off, and now we have four horns on the goat. Are we seeing a similarity here to anything that we've talked about before? What would that be? Without giving away the rest of the chapter, but just kind of going back. The what? All the kingdoms. Okay, we've talked about lots of kingdoms. And this particular goat is going to go from having one leader to having four leaders. Mm -hmm. 
And we're going to see who that is in a minute. But this is the most important thing here in chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. It says, out of one of them, one of what? Horns. One of the four horns came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. Where's the beautiful land? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's right. Israel, but Jerusalem specifically. It, and we're going to see that later in chapter 11, so it's important to know where we're talking about. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. Does this sound a little bit about like what we saw in the little horn last week in chapter 7? It does. A little different description as to what's going to happen, but it sounds... Like that. So we have a little horn from chapter 7, and now we have a small horn from, that's going to be called a king here in a while, uh, a small horn from chapter 8. It's so interesting to me that God doesn't just give us a Bible that starts in Genesis and goes all the way through chronologically to Revelation. The Bible doesn't do that. And he doesn't give us a list, and he says, okay, when you get to the Messiah in Genesis 3. When we see who the Messiah, that there's going to be a Messiah to save us from our sins, we don't have a whole list of everything we know about the Messiah. We've got to study all 66 books of the Bible to understand who God is talking about in Genesis 3. The same thing happens with the future. He doesn't give us a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 about the future. We have to study each of these books of the Bible to get glimpses. And specifically when it comes to the man that we call the Antichrist. Because he is called numerous things in scripture, none, none of which is the Antichrist. But he's called by lots of different names. And two of the names are the little horn from Daniel 7 and the small horn from Daniel 8. So I'm giving you a little heads up here that this is talking about the Antichrist. So let's continue seeing what we learn about him. We're talking about the Antichrist. Let me just go back for a moment and say that we knew that he grew exceedingly great, again, towards the south, east, and beautiful land. He grew up to the host of heavens, and the stars fell to earth, and it trampled them down. Now, we know that so far. We're seeing in these verses that this Antichrist, this, this small horn, it even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the hosts. Who's the commander of the hosts? Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. We're talking about God here. So he tried to magnify, magnify himself to be equal with God. That's an arrogant thing to do. It says, and it removed the regular sacrifices from him, meaning God. So the regular sacrifices are offered to God from where? Temple. The temple, from Jerusalem, from the Jews. They're the ones who offered sacrifices. And the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. Where's that? The temple. The temple of God was thrown down. All under this guy's authority. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn. Now, Dave, we have a little bit of an answer right there to the question that you have because it says here the host are going to be given over to the throne or to the horn. The host is what it said here. He grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth. Now we know that the, he's using that same phrase here when he says, um, uh, and on, the, wait a minute, where did I miss it? And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. So that tells you that the host is people. And if the regular sacrifices are given over to him, and they occur in what city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And who are the people that perform the regular sacrifices? The Jews. The Jews. So if those are given over to them, to him, who would the host be? The host would be the Jews. It says the host 
was, will be given over to him along with a regular sacrifice. And it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Now, we don't know why. We'll, we'll find out later again about this host. But we don't know why it says the host of heaven because that makes it sound like angels. Angels are the only ones that live in heaven besides God. But the context here tells us that this host is the Jews. <coughs> so he's going to go after the Jews, we're told here. Does that make <coughs> sense? Does that agree with what we learned in the book of Revelation? Yeah. Yes, it does. All right. Then we have some interesting time sequences in Daniel. This is why you need to know the word so well because it easily can be confused in some of these things. In Daniel 8, 13 and 14, it says, Daniel then said, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifices apply while the transgression causes horror? so as to allow the holy place and the host to be trampled. So a lot, there's a lot in that question. He's asking a particular time sequence, but he says, the regular sacrifice is going to stop. The transgression is going to happen. And this transgression causes what? Horror. Yes, so when the regular sacrifices stop, there's going to be a horrible situation that occurs. Do we know what that is? I said, I'm hearing mumblings. <laughs> we don't know from this context what this is. But we're going to see it later. And then we're going to see it in Daniel chapter 9. And then later in 11 and 12. Now going back, it says, On account of transgressions, the host will be given over to the horn. So there's going to be a huge transgression. The Jews are going to be given over into his hands along with the regular sacrifice and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. What is the only truth that we know to be truth? God and his word. That's it. There's nothing else that we know to be 100% true. You can trust your spouse with your life, but you don't always know that everything's 100% true. Hopefully they are, but we don't know because people make mistakes. Maybe not intentional, but they make mistakes. But God never makes a mistake. He is the only 100% truth. The book of Daniel is full of God saying things to Daniel about the same thing, but in different ways. It's kind of like telling stories about your grandchildren. And you might tell one story this way, and then you might talk to somebody else and tell the same story in a different way or add different information to it. That's what Daniel's doing and all of, the, that's what God is doing as he's giving Daniel all this wisdom and these visions. He keeps giving him further information. And, well, I'm not going to spoil it until we get there. He keeps giving him further information. All right, let's look now at verses 13 and 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, stop here, who are the holy ones? Angels. We'll see Gabriel's mentioned later. How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He answered and said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Is this a number we've seen before? Well, I'll make it easy on you. This is not a number we've seen before. This is not a date we've seen before. When we read the book of Revelation, what's the date? What's the number we get there? Three and a half years. years. 1260 days, 42 months. That is not this. 2300 days equals six and a half years. It's 76 months. That's not the number that we get in the book of Revelation. So this is something different. We don't know what yet, but this is something different. 2,300 evenings and mornings. Some people say because it says evenings and mornings, 
it's referring to half days. Mm -hmm. So instead of really 2,300 days, it would be 1,150 days. Well, maybe. But when it says evenings and morning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created them evening and morning is one day. So I believe this is talking about one day, but we'll get to that discussion later. If I forget to get to it, remind me, because in the interpretation, it doesn't go back to this dating. It doesn't tell us what this means. So remind me in case I forget. But there is this number. We're given a specific time frame here. There's lots of time frames in Daniel 8, and they can be very confusing if we don't know what this passage is saying. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. No kidding. And behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Uli, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. Isn't God great to give him an understanding? Now, we're going to find out the very last verse of this chapter tells us Daniel had no clue what all of this meant. But God gives him an understanding so that we can see it. So that we can see it, we can understand it, and we can prove it by history, as well as the rest of the Bible. So this is more for us than Daniel, but Daniel was going to write this down. So who's the man? We don't know. It doesn't tell us who the man is. I have no reason to believe it's Jesus because it said earlier that there were two angelic or two hosts of heaven or yeah. however it mag uh, said about it. So I tend to think this is probably two angels, mm -hmm. but the context doesn't tell us. Okay. Timing, Daniel 8, 17. So he came near to where I was standing. When he had come, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, son of man, understand that the whole vision pertains to when... I'm sorry, I didn't read that right. Understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. When is the time of the end? End times. End times. Yep. Okay. That's the time right before Jesus returns. That's the time of the end or the end times. He's telling us right there that this vision pertains to that end time. That means we need to understand this to understand end time Bible prophecies. All right, keep that in mind. Tells us in the next verses, in Daniel 8, 18 and 19. Now, while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand upright. You know, I don't know about you, but as I listen to that, I think <coughs> Daniel was probably so overwhelmed. He had no clue what was going on, didn't understand it, was probably uh, emotionally fatigued at what he was seeing and not understanding, that he just went, whoo, just went to sleep. And I mean, that's probably something I would do. At least, if nothing else, I'd want to lay down and rest and talk to the Lord, and then I'd go to sleep. <laughs> but it sounds like he was exhausted at what all of this meant. So it tells us then that the angel said, or the person said, Behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the what? final period of the indignation for it pertains to the what? Yes. Appointed time of the end. So we have two more time periods here. The final period of the indignation and then the appointed time of the end. All three of those timings sound like they're the end days, the time before Jesus Christ returns. Now we're going to have the interpretation we're told that the ram which you saw with two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. It's a ram with two horns. One's longer than the other. We know that Persia was a stronger country. It uh, dominated the Median Empire. And so it makes sense that that's what this means. Not that we always have to understand what it means, but... God wants us to understand. So this is a map of the Persian Empire. It was really big. It was much bigger than the Babylonian Empire, which you see, Babylonia is right there. It had conquered the Assyrian Empire. But it, if you recall, it said that this ram went to the north, south, and west. It didn't say anything about going to the east. Persia tried, actually, Greece tried more than Persia. 
tried to get into India and into this area here, and they couldn't. So they focused on going west and north and south, but not east. So this is a biblical description that matches with what history is that we know today. By the way, whenever you look at history or archaeology, they always match up 100% with what the Word of God says. We're going to come to chapter 11, and don't read it now because you're, gonna go, you're not going to understand it. I'm just going to tell you right now, you won't understand it. But I have a chart that I'm going to show you that is history that proves Daniel 11 to the T. I love how God does that. Now, Daniel didn't understand that when he's writing it because it was history written in advance. He, he didn't know the history yet. But we can look back and see how God does that. And we can look back here and see his description of Medio Persia is exactly what happened. Now we're going to get the De Goat interpretation. I don't think any of us are going to be surprised to learn this one. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn that is between the eyes is the first king. And his name is Alexander, Alexander the Great. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in his place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. So we've talked about these before, but I've got a map here for you. Whoops. This first map is the map of the Grecian Empire at the time that Alexander died. He went through, now I'm going to, actually for those of you who have a copy of this, I'll let you do it. But this is almost a duplicate map of the Persian Empire, except it includes Greece and Macedonia and Thrace up there just a little bit to the north of Greece, which makes sense because Alexander was first king of Greece and then he went east. Persia could never conquer Greece. The book of Esther, historically we believe that the king was having the big banquet with all of his nobles in preparation for an invasion on Greece. We know historically that Persia tried to destroy Greece or conquer it and never could. So this kingdom of Alexander's, again, is a duplicate except for the area of Greece. Nobody ever ends up going into India. Here we have the Grecian Empire that was divided into four. I told you last time, the Ptolemies, that was one of his kings, they went south into Egypt. The Seleucids went to the east and the north, and then they just a little a spoil alert right now. The Ptolemies and the Seleucids fought each other forever. Chapter 11 in Daniel is about these two nations fighting each other for control. And then you have Lysimachus who took over Western Turkey today or Asia Minor. And finally, Cassandra ended up inheriting the area of Greece. Now these were four generals who were friends of Alexander. He trusted them which is why before his death, he called them to himself and he gave them each one of these lands, these control of his Grecian empire. Now let me, so, so that answers what we were talking about there about the four kingdoms which will arise from his nation in Daniel 8, 22. Now I'm gonna go back and give you some history. There are 14 different books called the Apocrypha that the Protestants do not believe are part of God's inspired word, but the Catholics do. In the Council of Trent in the 16th century, after the Protestant Reformation, the Catholics codified these 14 books as scripture. The Protestants never did because they said that they don't agree with history, they don't agree with, they don't match up with the rest of scripture. But the Catholics did. So you have what's called the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha does have some good history and accurate history in it. That doesn't mean it's inspired. It doesn't mean it's all accurate. But the Book of Maccabees has great historical information. So I went there to get the information that matches up with this timing in history. And it starts out telling us in 1 Maccabees, there's two books of Maccabees. 1 Maccabees says... After Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, let me stop right here. Alexander's father, Philip, the Macedonian, as you see there, was a great general. And he's the one who was able to 
with Saul of Persia from conquering the Greek mainland. He was a great leader, but all he ever did was control parts of Greece. It was his son who came up and took over. His son, we know, was um, 20 years old when his father died and when he took over his kingdom, and he died at the age of 32. <coughs> In 12 years, he went from controlling Greece to the entire Persian Empire along with Greece. And then he died. So we're going to learn a little bit about Alexander right here. It tells us Alexander, who came from the land of Kittim, had defeated King Darius of the Persians and the Medes. He succeeded him as king. He had previously become king of Greece. We talked about that. He fought many battles, conquered strongholds, and slaughtered the kings of the earth. He advanced to the ends of the earth and plundered many nations. The ends of the earth was the Persian Empire, which was basically the ends of the earth at that time. Obviously, you had India uh, and era, some other areas, but they were not as populous. So that gives us a little history there, but let's continue. We go on to learn that when the earth became quiet before him, because he conquered everything, he was exalted and his heart was lifted up. He gathered a very strong army and ruled over countless nations, uh, over countries, nations, and princes, and they paid him tribute. After this, he fell sick and perceived that he was dying. Now, I, won't, I can't say it's history as maybe as well as tradition. It says that once he'd conquered all the known world, he did everything else to conquer, and he was all depressed, and he fell down and died <laughs> because he did everything else to conquer. Now, we don't know that that's what really happened, but he did die at a young age when it was all conquered. Now the history again from 1 Maccabees goes on to say, so he summoned his most honored officers who had been brought up with him from youth and divided his kingdom among them while he was still alive. After Alexander had reigned 12 years, he died. Then his officers began to rule each in his own place. They all put up crown on crowns after his death, and so did their descendants after them for many years. And they caused many evils on the earth. See, it doesn't tell us that about Alexander, but it does say it about his four generals who followed him. So we go now again to this map. You see how that expansive Persian Empire is now controlled by four different officers. Friends of Alexander's, people who fought with him, who should have known Alexander's character and the kind of leader he was and followed his example, but they didn't. At least one of them didn't. So we go on now to learn from the book of Daniel. We're back to true scripture now in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, 23 and 24. It says, In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressions have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. Now there's timing here. What's the timing? What? Okay, at the end of the Grecian rule. This is important to see what it's saying. It says, in the latter period of their rule. We're not talking about the latter period of the time of Christ. That's not what that says. We're talking at the latter time of the Grecian rule. So it's after Alexander, sometime during the period of his other generals taking over. It says a king's going to rise. This king is insolent and skilled in, in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. Now there we see the holy people, which is a term for the Jews, and it's a synonym to that, what you asked about earlier, David, the host of heaven, which are God's holy people. Okay, so now we have a new, a new person, the small horn that came up out of the four horns. That's who this person is, this little horn or small horn, or it's called here a king. So somebody put this together, and I think it's great because it really explains to us what history has told us. 
You have Alexander the Great, who used to have a horn here, at least according to Daniel, and it was broken off. And instead, four horns arose. And you see, interestingly enough, Anne, since you brought it up, the Ptolemy is the one that's curved and goes around, and yet the one we're talking about that's curved is Seleucids. But, uh, so you could actually put that there instead of the Ptolemies. You could put it the Seleucids. But this is an example in Daniel of the Grecian Empire and what happened to it. Now we learn that there's this other horn that is coming up and we see a horn coming up out of the Seleucid group, the Seleucid Empire. We know historically that his name was Antiochus Epiphanes IV. His father was Antiochus Epiphanes III, <laughs> obviously. So we have historical proof that matches up with the Bible about this person named Antiochus Epiphanes. And he came up in the latter period of the rule. He, was, uh, he lived from 215 to, to 164 BC. 51 years, 50, yeah, 51 years. But he reigned from 175 to 164. So he reigned for 11 years. That was the latter part. The Romans took over the Grecian Empire in 146 BC. So this, his, the end of his empire is only 18 years before the Romans would take over the Grecian Empire. So when we see at the beginning of Daniel 8.23, in the latter period of their rule, Antiochus Epiphanes is the leader at the latter time of the Grecian rule. Matches up with scripture. So let's go on. I'll give you a little bit more about Antiochus Epiphanes, but you can read a little bit in that picture right there. Daniel, getting back to truth of the Bible, tells us in chapter 8, verses 25 and 26, and through his shrewdness, now we're talking about this small horn that has arisen, through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart. He will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes. Who would that be? Jesus. Okay, God. But he will be broken without human agency. The vision of the evenings and mornings which you have been told is true. But keep the vision secret, for it pertains to when? Many days, many days in the future. We're not talking to the end of time now. We're talking about many days in the future. We know historically that there was this person named Antiochus Epiphanes. He did exactly what the Bible said he would do. He reigned at a time at the end of the Grecian Empire, and he was broken without human agency. Now I'm going to read to you from the book of Maccabees. You don't have this in your information. But uh, 2 Maccabees, there's two books of Maccabees. 2 Maccabees says, About that time as it happened, Antiochus had retreated in disorder from the region of Persia. He tried to go east and take over more of Persia, and he couldn't do it. So transported with rage, he conceived the idea of turning upon the Jews, the iniquity done by those who had put him to flight. We'll get to that in a minute. The Jews had done something to him, sent him into flight. He was really mad at them. We'll talk about that. But the, it says, so he's on his way back from Persia, and it says he ordered his charioteer to drive without stopping until he completed the journey all the way back to Israel. But the judgment of heaven rode with him. For in his arrogance, he said, quote, when I get there, I will make Jerusalem a cemetery for the Jews, end quote. Well, that's all God had to hear. <laughs> Says the all-seeing Lord, the God of Israel, struck him with an incurable and invisible blow. As soon as he stooped, stopped speaking, he was seized with a pain in his bowels by which there was no relief. And with sharp internal tortures, and with sharp internal tortures. And this was very justly, for he had tortured the bowels of others with many and strange afflictions. Mm -hmm. He was getting what he had given to others. But who gave it to him? God. It says God. Without human agency, it was God who 
caused it to happen. He goes on to say, yet he did not in any way stop his insolence, but was even more filled with arrogance, breathing fire in his rage against the Jews and giving orders to drive even faster. And so it came about that he fell out of his chariot as it was rushing along, and the fall was so hard as to torture every limb of his body. Thus he, who only a little while before had thought in his superhuman arrogance that he could command the waves of the sea and had imagined that he could weigh the high mountains in a balance, was brought down to earth and carried in a litter, making the power of God manifested to awe. And so the ungodly man's body swarmed with worms, and while he was still living in anguish and pain, his flesh rotted away. And because of the stench, the whole army felt revulsion at his decay. Do you think that answers the prophecy of Daniel that says that he's going to be broken without agency? Yes. Now, again, that's not Bible that's telling us that, but it's history. And so we are assuming it's true. It certainly does match up with Scripture. The book of Maccabees, the Maccabees, well, we're going to see who the Maccabees are in a few minutes. The book of Maccabees, again, is one of the two of the 14 extra biblical books that the Catholics have in their Bible, but the Protestants don't. And the reason the Protestants don't is because it doesn't match up with the criteria necessary to confirm it's the word of God, and it doesn't agree with other aspects of the word of God. This is telling us of what's going to happen at the end of the Grecian Empire with this little horn that is broken off. But if you read this correctly, you're going to see that everything about him matches up with the Antichrist in the future. And that's the idea of the dual prophecy. So let's keep watching to see if what he says and does matches up with the Antichrist of the future. And I have to tell you, by going back, you recall at the beginning of Daniel 8, we're told that this vision pertains to the time of the future, the time at the end. So even though it's happening, not in Daniel's time, it won't happen for a few hundred years after Daniel, but even though it's happening in the intertestament time, it also could be a first prophecy with the fulfillment again happening at the end before Jesus returns. So this is a classic dual prophecy in Scripture. The vision of, it's, it does say here, um, the vision of the evening and mornings, which have been told, is true. But keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. So it says days in the future. We're talking about years from Daniel's time, but we're not talking the end of time. So what we're seeing about this little horn is specifically dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes, give or take 165 B.C. But... It is a dual prophecy, as we will see. So when it's talking here about the timing, the mornings and the evenings, if we do our own research, we will see that, the, that Antiochus Epiphany's reign over Israel was 2,300 days. Mm -hmm. It was 76 months. It was six and a third years. It was from um, 170 to 164 B.C., so that matches historically with what Daniel says here. It doesn't match with the 1,250 days, 60 days in Revelation, 42 months in Revelation. So this is a different time. Right now, we're talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. At this time period, 170 to 164 B.C. Okay, questions? Let's go on. History. Now we're going to go back to the history. This is the history in Maccabees. And it tells us, from them came forth a sinful root. And from then it's talking about the four kingdoms that divided after Alexander. And it says, Antiochus Epiphanes, son of King Antiochus, in those days certain renegades came out from Israel and mislead, misled many, saying, let us go and make a covenant with the nations around us. This proposal pleased them, and some of the people eagerly went to the king, that's Antiochus, who authorized them to observe the ordinances of the nations. Let me give you a little history here, because at the time of the Grecian Empire, 
there was a cultural system called Hellenism. Hellenism comes from uh, Hellenistic, which comes from the Greek people. And uh, really, it, it dealt with a lot of things. One was sports. You know that we had the first Olympics in Greece because they were very sports-minded, athletically minded. Another thing was their clothes. They wore certain kind of clothes that were different from other people around the world. They obviously had the Greek language, which was very significant, became the language of the land, which turned out to be a real blessing because then the Greek, the New Testament was written in Greek, very specific language. So uh, then you had uh, the morals, the morality. Well, there was none. They did not have much morality. They followed after the pagan gods, all of the mythological gods, and there was no morality in that culture. So that's the culture that we're told that the people all around, including the people of Israel, said, let us go and make a covenant with the nations around us. And the proposal pleased the Jews. Can you imagine? Does that match up with what God has told them to do and how they're to live? No, it does not. So let me give you an example. Again, this is in history. It tells us about the Jews. So they went and built a gymnasium in Jerusalem according to the customs of the nations. Now again, it's all about athletics and strength and power. And did women go to the, these gymnasiums? No, it was only men. And when they were there, that's when they did all their political, their pol politicizing and all their plannings. And it said, the Jews made foreskins for themselves and abandoned the Holy Covenant. Now, what does that mean, they made foreskins for themselves? They were circumcised. And okay. The Jews were circumcised. Why were they circumcised? Set apart. They were set apart to be different than the other nations. In Genesis 17, we're told that that's the covenant that God made with the Jews was ratified through blood. That's all of God's covenants are ratified through blood. And the blood of the covenant with the Jews was circumcision, where everyone would be circumcised. Well, if the Jews want to be like all the other Hellenistic nations, and they're going to build a gym, and they go into the gym, because when the guys went into the gym, they went in naked. They didn't wear any clothes. These guys are going to walk into the gym, and what's the first thing that people are going to notice? They're circumcised, and that's going to set them apart from the Hellenistic or the non-Jewish people. So they are going to hide the circumcision. Now, don't ask me. I have no clue <laughs> how they could do that. But it says here they made foreskins for themselves, and it says they abandoned the Holy Covenant. The covenant, the circumcision was the covenant proof of the covenant that God made with his people. And so they were abandoning it. They joined with the nations and sold themselves to do evil. I want you to see, as we're reading about this, the similarities between what the Jews chose to do. At this point, they don't have to. They're the ones in the previous verse in the history said, we want to be like the other nations. We want to do this. It was voluntary. And then they went and they became like the other nations and they gave up their holy covenant. Does that sound like today? Yeah. Yeah. It sounds a lot like today to me, especially if we look at countrywide. Because you have people all around the world, the World Economic Forum being the number one agency, as well as the United Nations, wanting to bring all the countries of the world together into their plan. And we just need to come together. We're all going to get along and it's going to be great for everybody. And guess what? Our country wants to do it. We're jumping at the opportunity to do this. Well, part of this whole World Economic Forum stuff is anti-God. It has nothing to do with the relationship with God. At this point, they're not telling us we can't practice our religion here in the United States, except during COVID. Uh, but uh, we're not told that. But if they don't support God, it's only a matter of time. But it doesn't matter here because the Jews are giving up their freedom. So they could be like all the other nations. Are we going to give up our freedoms? So we can coalesce with all the other nations? Got to be careful. Now, going back again to the history of Antiochus. 
It says, two years later, the king sent to the cities of Judah a chief collector of tribute. He came to Jerusalem with a large force. Deceitfully, <laughs> he spoke peaceable words to them, and they believed him. But he suddenly fell upon the city, dealt it a severe blow, and destroyed many people of Israel. He plundered the city, burned it with fire, and tore down the houses and its surrounding walls. Can you trust the people that come to you and say, oh, this is for your good. This is for the best. We're going to hear in the near future that the center bank digital currency is for our benefit. It's going to help us. We're not getting into that today. Come to our Bible prophecy <laughs> event on October 6th or 5th or whatever that Thursday is, and I'll tell you about it then. But it's not for our good, folks. When people tell you it's for your good, you better step back and say, okay, is it really? Yeah. Going back to history now, we're told, then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that all should give up their particular customs. I mean, this is the one world government we're seeing. We should all be one people, give up all of our customs and our, our particular uh, nationalities and all be part of one. All the nations accepted the command of the king. Many even from Israel gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messenger to Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. Because you see, we just all want to get along. We want to be part of everybody else who gets along. And we want people to take care of us. And this king is going to take care of them. It all sounds so good, but it's not. It goes on to say in this history, he directed them, and this is the Jews, to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary. Those are the sacrifices outlined in the first several verse chapters of Leviticus. They also needed to profane the Sabbaths and festivals, to defile the sanctuary and the holy ones, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines from idols, to sacrifice pigs and other unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. So you can't do what your law says to do, what your religion says you're to do, what God has told you to do, and instead we want you to do all these other things. Build altars, sacrifice to other gods, sacrifice pigs. What's wrong with that? They're unclean animals. Boy, they. The Jews cannot eat bacon or pork. They're unclean. And it says, uh, and they're to leave their kids uncircumcised. Not to do that, even though it's a covenant of God, if they want to get along. What are we willing to give up to get along? Are we willing to give up? You know, during COVID, we willingly gave up going to church. I think... Um, some of us who were so busy went, oh, I've got some time off. I'm just going to enjoy the time off, and I'm going to spend time with the Lord instead of going to church. And then we started watching church online, and that was fine. And then we got to the point that we really missed church. At least some of us did. I know a lot of people who've never gone back to church since then because they got comfortable not going to church. Well, we have to be careful because if we start down that slippery slope... We don't know what's going to happen. Now it says uh, at the end here, and whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. Shall die. Does this sound familiar? Have we seen this before in the book of Daniel? We saw it with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, we certainly saw it with Daniel and the lion's den. But we saw it with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They wouldn't go worship to the king. The king brought them before him and said, I'm going to give you another chance. And they said, we don't need to think about it. Our God will protect us. But even if he doesn't, we will not worship your statue. You are your statue. They stood up. And what did God do? He protected them in the fiery furnace. Well, we're going to see the Jews are going to stand up. But they're not going to be protected. They're going to die. So when we stand up for righteousness, 
We're not always protected. Sometimes we become martyrs. And the Jews did. But we want to see what happens here because this is a great story. So we are now with King Antiochus. It says, King Antiochus set up the terrible idol of Baal over the very altar of God and similar altars in the surrounding towns of Judah. Now, some people say he put up an idol of um, Zeus, the statue of Zeus. But whatever it was, he went into the Holy of Holies and built a statue to a pagan god. It says, anyone found possessing the book of the covenant or anyone who adhered to the law was condemned to death by decree of the king. So there may come a time when we're not even allowed to have Bibles. Do you know enough of God's word in memory of each of the books or in memorization that if you were to lose your Bible, you'd still be able to worship God with his word? That's a good reason to memorize scripture. Because here they were forbidden from having the law by command of, or being condemned to death by decree of the king. They kept using violence against Israel, against those who were found month by month in the towns. According to the decrees, they put to death the women who had their children circumcised and their families and those who circumcised them. And then they hung the infants from their mother's necks. Is that brutal? Yeah. And that's all because the Jews wanted to be like everybody else. They just wanted to get along. They wanted to be part of the kingdom. They want to enjoy the freedoms that they had throughout all the Hellenistic world. And this is what happened. When we turn against God, all kinds of abominations, first of all, we will be compromising ourselves to follow these abominations and then there will be consequences, as they were for the people at that time. But all is not lost, because many stood faithful. Are you one of the ones that would stand faithful in circumstances like this? Again, this is history. This is not Bible. But we're told that many in Israel stirred firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. They chose to die rather than to be defiled by food or be to, to profane the holy covenant. And what happened to them? They died. they died. Would you die rather than to profane God and his word, rather than to go with the ways of the world? They did. It says, Very great wrath came upon Israel. In those days, Mattathias, a priest of the clan of Jorib, moved from Jerusalem and settled in Modian. The reason he moved from Jerusalem is that's where all these abominations were taking place. He had five sons. He saw the blasphemies being committed in Judah and Jerusalem. So it is Mattathias that we eventually get the name for the Maccabees. Mm -hmm. He is what you would call the leader of the Maccabees. They're an important group of people that we'll read about as we continue. Then the king's officers spoke to Mattathias as follows. Your leader, be the first to come and do what the king commands. And all the nations and the people of Judah, just as they have done. But Mattathias answered and said in a loud voice. Why a loud voice? So everybody could hear. Even if all the nations that live under the rule of the king obey him and have chosen to obey his commandments, every one of them af um, abandoning the religion of their ancestors, I and my sons and my brothers will continue to live by the covenant of our ancestors. Yay. Yay. Yay is right. Praise the Lord for godly people who will stand up for righteousness. You know, <coughs> the old saying in America, <clears throat> Uncle Sam, he just needs a few good men. Well, God just needs a few good men. And Mattathias and his sons were those men. We need leaders who will stand up for righteousness because there are those of us, most of us are followers. And if we have a good leader, we will follow him. 
And we will go to the ends of the earth with the Lord following this leader because he's going to lead us in righteousness. Unfortunately, we'll also follow the other guys and we'll do what they tell us to do if our eyes are not totally, totally focused on God and his word. The Jews chose to follow King Antiochus Epiphanes except Mattathias and his sons and some other people. Which group would you be in? You know, we read these, I've read these for 50 years. And I always say, well, I'll be in God's group. Well, that's nice to say. But folks, we're coming to a time where we may have to make these decisions. I never thought I'd say that here in the United States. But it's a different world that we live in now. And we shouldn't be surprised. If Jesus is coming soon, we have to have a one world government, which means the United States has to de decrease in power. We have to give up our autonomy and all the things that we've become comfortable with and the great life that we've had. Things are going to change. We've seen a lot change, but they're going to continue to change. Are we going to be ready for it? I read a quote this week. I can't remember exactly what it was or who said it, but it was basically at times of crisis like this in our country or here, that's when we need to be ready to stand up. That's when instead of shying away, God needs us to be standing up front and being faithful to his kingdom. Are you going to be one of those people? Mattathias was. So he says in, um, we see in the next part of history again in the book of Maccabees, then Mattathias cried out in the town with a loud voice saying, let everyone who is zealous for the law and supports the covenant come out with me. Then he and his sons fled to the hills and left all that they had in the town. So they made this decision that day. Oh, let me backtrack before I get into that last verse. They fled to the hills and several fled with him. But you know what? The enemy came against them on the Sabbath. And because these were staunch Jews, they wouldn't fight on the Sabbath. And they were all killed. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Where when they came after the Jews, the Jews felt they just needed to submit and surrender and do what they said instead of fighting. Well, because of what Mattathias saw, it says here at the bottom, so they made the decision that day, let us fight against anyone who comes to attack us on the Sabbath day. Let us not all die as our kindred died in their hiding places. So there's times when we have to put God's word on hold in order to protect ourselves, in order to do what's right. And I don't mean to disobey God's word, but they had to give up. Their, their Sabbath said they couldn't walk more than a few blocks, and they couldn't do any laborious work. But they knew if that was the case, they were all going to die. And they needed to keep their lineage, their Jewish heritage. So they didn't do that. Or they were willing to fight. These people... This family and these friends of theirs fought against Antiochus Epiphanes and his whole army. Now, if you remember the map I showed you before, he had big territory and he had lots of people in his army. How could these people defeat him? Actually, that's not a rhetorical question. How could these people defeat him? God. Only by the power of God. God just needs a few good men who will obey him, and he'll do the rest. Read some of the stories in Scripture. I, one of my favorite is that um, uh, with Hezekiah, and uh, they went out against the enemy. They sought God. They humbled themselves before God. And when they woke up the next day, all the enemy was dead. Yeah. And then another time, the enemy killed each other. And another time, God stopped the sun for 24 hours so just Joshua could... Continue fighting with his men and defeat the army. God will do amazing things yeah. if we will let him. But we back off to it's just easier to compromise. It's just easier to submit. No, folks, not when it means going against the word of God. Never is it easier. It's easier, maybe, but it's not what God wants us to do. So what did these people do? They defeated Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes and they rebuilt the temple. Then Judas and his brothers, Judas was his younger son because all the sons ended up dying and so did Mattathias. Judas and his brothers said, see our enemies are crushed. Let us go up to, the, to cleanse the sanctuary and dedicate it. 
So all the army assembled and went up to Mount Zion. There they saw the sanctuary desolate, the altar profaned, and the gates burned. They built a new altar like the former one. They also built the sanctuary and the interior of the temple and consecrated the courts. A few good men up against this huge army, and God allowed them to defeat Antiochus Epiphanes and his army. That's why he was so distressed when I read to you how he died and how God took him when he went to Persia and was coming back to Israel because he was so mad at what Israel had done. He was going to come back and destroy them. We have history again here. We're told early in the morning on the 25th day of the ninth month, which is the month of Chislev, in the 148th year, they arose and offered sacrifices as the law directs and on the new altar of burnt offerings that they had built. It was dedicated with songs and harps, with lutes and cymbals. All the people fell on their faces and did what? Worshipped and blessed heaven. Now these are the, all the people. That means a lot of the people that had turned away from God, that had followed Hellenism, that wanted the king and his way of living, they'd had a change of heart once they saw what the king was really like and what he was really doing and what they had turned away from. And it says, so they celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days and joyfully offered burnt offerings. They offered a sacrifice of well-being and a thanksgiving offering. What a day of celebration. What day is this? Not, not, not you. <laughs> you, know, you know the answer. What day is this? Nope, this is not Yom Kippur. Day of she said Day of Atonement. Nope, not Day of Atonement. It's Hanukkah. It's the Feast of Hanukkah. In Scripture, it's not called the Feast of Hanukkah. It's called the Feast of Dedication. In John chapter, where is it? Chapter 10, verse 22. It says that at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. That's the only time this feast is mentioned, but it shows that this was such an important event because it took place in 165, 164 B.C., you know, 200 years before Christ is walking in the portico of Solomon on the Temple Mount. Everybody was still rejoicing over this because the Jews had not only defeated the uh, King Antiochus Epiphanes, but they had taken back their worship and they were serving God. Now, a lot changed in that 200 years. I'm not going to give you the history tonight, but the, the Jews didn't always follow God during those 200 years. But here they did. And this was the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Hanukkah. Now, what makes Hanukkah unique? What happened at Hanukkah? A, a little bit of it is here in this passage, but what was so unique about Hanukkah? When they came into the temple, there was enough oil to last for one day. If you know anything about the oil in the temple, well, oil, when you press olive oil, you get three kinds of oil. One's cooking oil, one's temple oil, and one is, um, can't think what the other oil is. I think maybe it's used for soaps and things. But anyway, the pure oil always went to the temple, the first and purest. Well, when they got to the temple and they were rebuilding it, all they found was one day's worth of pure oil. And yet that oil burned for eight days, long enough for them to produce more oil for the burning of the menorah in the temple. That's why there's an eight-candled menorah at Hanukkah, actually sometimes nine because they have a center one, uh, versus the normal seven-candled menorah in the Jewish culture because of this holiday. And it's because Daniel said this was going to happen. Uh, he didn't say quite this was going to happen, but he talked about oppression and the things that were going to happen. And he was relating to, basically, just relating to what was going to happen that we know did happen with Antiochus Epiphanes. So keep in mind what's history here 
and what's Bible. Because the history tells us that what happened in the, what was prophesied in the Bible came true. But history gives us a lot more information. No one explained the vision. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted for, and f sick for days. Then I got up and carried on the king's business, but I was astonished at the vision, and there was none to explain it. Well, you can understand that. <laughs> what we understand about this vision is, to is mostly from history. Well, he didn't have that because he didn't have the history. Mm -hmm. We do, but he didn't have it at that time. And so we know what was going to happen and what what we were told was going to happen, we know that it did happen. And we know that we now have a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes who is a precursor to the Antichrist. How do we know that from this passage? I gave you a hint earlier. Let me see if, when I, where I can find it. Okay. It's in Daniel 8, 17, where Daniel was told, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. And we were also told that it, was, it pertained to the time of the end of the Grecian Empire. So this vision pertained to two different time periods. One was Antiochus Epiphanes at the time of the Grecian Empire, and the other one is the end of days, which is the Antichrist. What we learned about Antiochus Epiphanes is an example of what the Antichrist is going to be like. And a very important aspect of it is Antiochus Epiphanes went into the temple and he offered, he built a statue and offered sacrifices to Baal in the temple. Do you know what that's called? You know what Jesus called that? The abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, 15. And he said, when you see the abomination of desolation take place, flee. That's what Jesus said to the Jews in the end times. We know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the Antichrist is going to do the same thing. There we're told that what he's going to do is um, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, well, in 2, 3, he's called the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. Does that sound like Antiochus Epiphanes? Mm -hmm. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And that's in effect what Antiochus Epiphanes did. So Daniel chapter 8 gives us a view of an upcoming event that was going to happen th 300 years after Daniel, 400 years after Daniel, but then a future event of the Antichrist that we're going to see. In, we're not going to see him, but the world will see in the end times. No wonder Daniel's so confused. He has no idea that there's dual prophecies being fulfilled. He doesn't know anything about the Grecian Empire. He doesn't know what's happening. He's just recording the vision. But what he knows is it's going to be devastating for his people. Now, I've given you a timeline, a chart, to show you where we are through chapter 8. So you have the dates and how old Daniel is and some basic information. It's kind of hard to read, but uh, at least you have it. You can do that research on your own. And then I put together, and this is more of your own research until we get around to talking about it another time, an explanation of the prophecies that we've seen in Daniel. Because <coughs> some of the prophecies in Daniel point to times before the coming of Christ the first time. And other prophecies point to the end of times before Christ returns. So in order to try and help you see what's what, I put it in a chart form. This is kind of something you have to study on your own or take a look at at your own so that you, whoops, so that you can see the difference. Let me say, okay. So let me go to the homework and then I'll come back. Next week, Daniel's prayer is a mighty prayer for himself and his country. Pray that prayer every day this week for yourselves and for the United States. I encourage you to. We'll talk about it next week. And then Daniel 9, 24 to 27 is the foundation of the future, of God's plans for the future. See if you can figure out what it means. We'll come talk about it next week. Now going back to this, I'll just leave this up here for a few minutes. 
because it shows that a lot of the prophecies dealt with things that have already happened. We know historically that these happened, even though Daniel did not know as he was writing them down what they would look like because they had not yet happened. These are prophecies in Daniel that either are dual fulfillments or are specifically prophesied for the end times. We've made it through chapter 8. I've given you a little vision of the last couple of chapters to let you see how they too are going to deal with future prophecy. That means since God knows the past, the present, and the future, when he gives us this information, he's telling us what's going to happen in the future. He's preparing us so that we'll be ready in these last days or for these last days. Or at least we will recognize the signs of the times and then ask ourselves, are we going to be like the Maccabees, these people who stood up for righteousness in dark times against a dark government? Or are we just going to live our lives comfortably and compliant, sitting on our fat aces and, <laughs> and uh, enjoying life until God takes us home? I hope not, because God never calls us to retire from his work. God has put us here for such a time as this. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to be an Esther or not? Father, thank you for this vision of Daniel that gives us information that history has proven to be 100% accurate. And yet it also focuses us on the future that's going to be a replication of what happened with Antiochus Epiphanes. The Antichrist will be an example of him in the future. We won't know who the Antichrist is. We shouldn't even focus on him. But it's important we know about him. And it's important we see what's going on so that we can tell other people that God has given us all this information. And it's not a surprise to him, and it shouldn't be a surprise to us. Let us live in a God-honoring way, seeking you as our Lord, our Abba Father, focusing on you and what you want us to do in these days rather than the negatives that we're seeing all around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining Living Word Ministries. Living Word Ministries is a viewer-supported program. Please visit www.livingwordministry.org for more Bible studies and information. And please join us again for Living Word Ministries.